This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. And of course, welcome to episode 200, incredibly 200 episodes. And of course, it's the guests that we've been talking about for a few weeks now, and we could not have welcomed a better guest, right, Ben, for our 200th episode. So we welcomed and had a phenomenal conversation with Professor Eugene Fama. It, it really was a phenomenal conversation. There were a lot of uh, a, a lot of surprising answers. We we kind of ask questions that we know the answer to, which is why we're asking them a lot of the time. Um, but today, with with Professor Fama or, or Gene, as he asked us to call him, uh, there were a few answers that were not what I was anticipating, which was great. Uh, expanded my my knowledge, and as you agreed in your in your discussion with him, like money, for example, as a topic is really hard. It was a really interesting part of the conversation there. Right, we we, we talked about well crypto and monetary theory at the end for a bit, and uh, that that's one of the areas where some of the things that Gene said were not what I was expecting, uh, and it was it was very interesting to hear. To hear his thoughts. Well, one of the things people don't know about, or a lot of people don't know about Gene is that in addition to his highly influential papers on market efficiency and asset pricing, he has highly cited papers in many, many areas of mm-hmm. economics, not just uh, not just stuff that's related to asset markets or, or stock and bond markets. Um, but he's got a bunch of stuff on monetary theory and money and banking. Uh, from the '80s, I believe that are that are highly cited. Uh, anyway, so it was it was interesting to talk to him about some of that stuff. So I know most listeners know about Gene, but he's he's certainly probably best known as the father of modern finance. And of course, in 2013, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for empirical analysis of asset prices, along with Lars Hansen and, and Robert Schiller. Probably best known for his empirical work on portfolio theory, asset pricing, and of course, the efficient market hypothesis. He is currently the Robert R. McCormick Distinguished Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and he joined there in 1963. Like you think of that career of studying all of this, it's incredible. He's had more than 100 articles published in academic journals and is clearly among the most cited researchers in economics. Yeah, it was in, it, it, you said he's, he's currently the, uh, the Robert R. McCormick Distinguished Professor. And uh, one of the things he told us is that he doesn't plan to retire. So c- currently and uh, for, for a, a while to come still. <laughs> yeah. He, he also talked about his, his, uh, how he works in terms of how he allocates his time for working, that was that was fascinating. Yeah, he talked about the successful research career he's had with his longtime colleague, Professor Ken French, who of course was our guest in episode 100. And uh, Ken's also, uh, Gene and Ken are both longtime board members of Dimensional Fund Advisors. Anything else, Ben, to add? No, I, I mean, yeah, like Gene goes without without an introduction. So I, I think we've we've said enough, and it's as we've already said a few times, a phenomenally good conversation. We covered a, a lot of ground. <laughs> uh, we from from listening to Gene's past interviews, we 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 kind of knew that he he gives concise answers. So I mean, maybe as a point of interest, I'll, I'll say how many questions we 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 asked roughly sixty questions which is twice what we would normally consider a high amount of questions to ask a guest. Usually 30 is like, okay, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. And this time we asked 60 and uh, we got through it in, in a pretty short amount of time considering the number of questions. And every answer was crisp and full of, well, the, the amount of insight you'd expect from someone with this many years thinking about all this stuff. And it's hard because there's so many questions that you could have followed up with. And I'm sure as people are listening to it, they say, oh, what about this? What about that? And it's such a thoughtful, incredible person and career. 
We we did a few though. I mean, on on yeah. uh, size, for example, Jean Jean talked about how there really is no theoretical reason for there to be a size premium. So I I, I kind of I heard that, and then later on in the interview, I I circled back and was like, hold on, why is it in the model then? And uh, he he gave his answer. Yeah. And then likewise, when we were talking about monetary theory, there was something that well, the thing that I mentioned where it just wasn't what I what I was expecting. So we dug into that for a bit. Yeah, anyway, we're we're doing too much talking. Yeah. We should go to the this phenomenal conversation for our two hundredth episode with Gene Fama. Professor Gene Fama, welcome to the Rational Reminder Podcast. Thank you. Gene, what does it mean for a market to be efficient? Well, a simple statement is that prices reflect all available information. What are the main implications for investors if markets are efficient? Well, you can't uh, expect that activities like picking stocks are actually going to generate superior returns for you. So you you get the risk-adjusted return appropriate to the risk level that you take with your portfolio, but you can't expect more. So that's another way of that's another way of, to uh, phrase the efficient markets uh, hypothesis. So your risk-adjusted returns are basically, expected returns are basically zero. Hmm. So what are the empirical tests that support market efficiency? Uh, so the, the best, I'll tell you, warn you in the beginning, I, I chuckle when there's bad news. So <laughs> if you hear chuckling, you know bad news is coming. So the, the strongest evidence from your perspective is that um, if I look at managed portfolios, actively managed portfolios, what I find basically is the distribution of returns around zero for excess returns are kind of normally distributed around zero before fees and expenses. After fees and expenses, it's a big negative sum game uh, for those who, who go into that uh, active management uh, game. So that's so the, the dis distribution of outcomes looks a lot like what you'd expect by chance if there were no ability to pick investments that have above normal risk adjusted returns. So that, that's the strongest evidence, I think, from the perspective of investors. Hmm. Hmm. D does market efficiency imply that returns are random? Uh, no, well, it depends on what you mean by random. That the, the deviations of returns from their expected values, where the expected value is a function of the risk of the security, that the deviations of the returns from the expected values are zero. Hmm. So what are the biggest empirical challenges to market efficiency? Oh, so I don't know if it still still is, but in the past there was momentum was the, was the, was the biggest one. Um, aside from that, well, if you really want to push it to the limit, the fact that insiders make money in their trades is a violation of market efficiency as far as those investors are, are concerned. So the insiders clearly have information that isn't already in the market price and they can profit from it. What's kind of surprising is that their average profits are so low. <laughs> so they're about 1%. <laughs> You made a quick remark there, but I want you to elaborate. Why would momentum no longer be a challenge? To market well, I, don't I, don't, I don't know. I haven't seen any updates of the evidence. That's all. So the, okay. the evidence goes back maybe 10 or 15 years. So I haven't seen what it looks like for the last, where since the last paper was published. Easy enough though. Ken, Ken French on his website has momentum portfolios. So you can go in there and, and check the last 10 or 15 years anytime you like. Do, do the empirical challenges like like momentum, do, does that change the way that investors should behave? Not really, because it's such a short-term phenomenon and it's such a high trading cost phenomenon that there's not really any way to take advantage of it. Hmm. So is there an efficient markets explanation for what happened with GameStop? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow these, these individual little... Uh, you no know, aberrations, if you might say. But remember now, efficient markets is a model. We, we call it a model because it's not reality. It's, it's an approximation. Models are approximations. It's an approximation that works quite well for almost everything you want to do in investing, 
but sometimes there are aberrations. So I, I didn't follow this GameStop thing very closely, but apparently that was a, a, a an aberration of a, a small stock that went crazy. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's about the story, yeah. <laughs> uh, do, do the ongoing flows into passive funds pose any, any potential challenges for market efficiency? Well, you, you can't have 100% of the money going into uh, passive funds because then there's nobody there to, you know, trade to make the market efficient. So the people who actually have information that other people don't have, uh, you, you want them to stay in the, in the market and use that information. Uh, so the, the real question that nobody's never answered, ever answered is, how many of those people are there out there? How many does it take to make the market efficient? So most of the trading by these investors just offsets the, the dumb things that other active managers do. So <laughs> active management doesn't always make the market more efficient. Sometimes it makes it less efficient because people make bad bets. Um, so the, the, the informed people have to offset these uninformed people who make the, make the bad bets. So it takes more informed to offset the uninformed, the more uninformed there are. Hmm. Interesting. Do you think that the inelastic markets hypothesis changes anything for the relationship between flows and pricing? Uh, no, that, that one's that one, that's a hot new one. So that's my colleague two doors down from me, Ralph Kojin, is, is working on that. But I want to see how that evolves to see what its investment implications are. So basically, that's a different point. That, the point there is that the demand for individual securities is not flat at a given price. That uh, trading actually... When people move into a security, it actually has a, a permanent effect on the, on the price. Now, they, they haven't really finished testing that out. But what they, their initial stuff looks very, very challenging, not for market efficiency, but for the idea that, you know, trading doesn't have a big effect on, on, on prices. Um, so we'll see how that all works out. But it's a very uh, interesting new line of work. Hmm. So interesting. So, Gene, what are the shortcomings of the, the CAPMs, of the capital asset pricing model, as an asset pricing model? Yeah. I spent my early life on, uh, a long time ago as one of the initial testers of, of the model. And for the uh, first, like, 10 or 15 years that the model was around, it did pretty well on the data. And then the so-called anomalies started to pop up, where people were uncovering things that were inconsistent with the the model's predictions. And little by little, basically, at one point, Ken and I wrote a paper that said, Ken French and I wrote a paper that said, there are just too many anomalies here. This model is dead. So, and the, the, the basic problem in the end was, if you look at a long period of data, the relation between market betas and average returns is basically flat. And according to that model, it shouldn't be flat. Returns should increase with Average returns should increase with, with market beta. And there's not much evidence of that uh, in the data. So that's kind of the first order implication of the model, and it doesn't stand up uh, very well. So asset price, it would have been great if that model really stood up to the data because it's such a simple model. You can teach it to almost any students in 15 minutes, and they get the, and they, and they get the story. And then, now the world looks a lot more complicated, <laughs> complicated than that. How did you and Ken choose the size and value factors to create the the three factor asset pricing model? How do we? Well, we what we chose them based on the fact that these were uh, at the time the two biggest anomalies for the CAPM to deal with. So the CAPM couldn't couldn't explain small stock returns, and it couldn't explain the difference between value and, and growth stock returns. So we said, okay, we'll add to the market portfolio these two factors that will basically absorb those two, two effects. So where does the three-factor model struggle to explain the differences in returns? Well, momentum, the one thing we started with blows it up. So nothing explains momentum except momentum. So if you want to explain momentum, you put it in a momentum factor. Otherwise, you haven't got a chance. How did you guys choose to, to add profitability and investment to, to the five-factor model? There's some justification for that in terms of, uh, you know, just this normal valuation theory, which says if you hold constant, um, 
to whole constant other variables, um, then you should observe a positive relation between uh, profitability and expected returns. But that's a uh, holding constant is important there. It's not, you know, it's not a one dimensional uh, s story. So we put that in there based on that. I'm not sure. We also put in an investment uh, factor. So when you, when you consider all these things together, what you should see is that average returns very positively with profitability and negatively with, with uh, investment. Uh, and that's this evidence of that in the data, but the, in, the investment part of that is kind of weak. Um, so I'm hoping, my hope is to have less factors that you need rather than more, because the simpler the world is, the easier it is to uh, deal with it. So I'd be really happy if those two factors dropped out of the story because there wasn't much empirical uh, support for them. I'd be real happy if it turned out that in the long term, the CAPM worked really well because then our lives would be a lot simpler <laughs> in, in that case. Uh, but so far it hasn't worked. Is the five-factor model still an empirical model or, or is definitely an empirical model. Okay. It's got some weak underpinnings in valuation theory, but I'll emphasize the weak. Hmm. So are high profitability and low investment firms riskier than their low profitability and high investment counterparts? Right. So if you, if you tell me that two firms with the same profitability um, and one has, does more investing than the other and they have the same price, well, then one of them has to be riskier if the market's pricing things uh, efficiently. So that's kind of the notion. Where does the five-factor model sh fall short? Is it still still momentum? It's uh, investment. The investment dimension of that is kind of shaky. Um, and profitability, well, that's that's somewhat better. But we haven't looked at that for since we wrote that paper. That's almost must be almost ten years now. But. So why isn't momentum in the model? Well, because I can't tell a rational story for it. So if I can't tell a rational story for it, well, it's just it's just a violation of market efficiency. So there are such violations. What you do you think about the- You don't want your asset pricing models to be tautologies, basically. You, mm -hmm. you just throw in, this, this has been a problem developed. People have kind of lost interest in asset pricing because of the proliferation of factors. So people come out with papers where there are 100 factors. Of course, that when you when you put them together, you find out that they're really up to 100. That a lot of them are more or less the same thing. Um, but that, that kind of kills all interest in asset pricing because it becomes too flexible at that point. Hmm. So you, you, you don't think all of the factor research that's happening right now is a, is a good thing for asset pricing? No, uh, no. Well, I think it's stopped, actually. I think people have stepped back and said, hey, is this really interesting or not? And hmm. how are we going to shovel our way out of it if it isn't? Hmm. What do you think about the Q factor model, if you've looked at that? You, so the Q factor model is basically value, isn't it? Is it yeah, price the book or something like that? Yeah, it's got it. Remember now, <laughs> if you look at the investment business, right, 90% of it is marketing, right? So they come up with a, a new name for an old idea. This is basically lots of what goes on as research in the, in the, in the uh, investment sector. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, how sure can we be that factored premiums are not simply the product of you know, data dredging. Ah, that's a good, that's a really good question. So in our stuff, what we do is when we come up with a model based on U.S. data for a particular time period, then we take it out of sample for a different time period. So when we originally did the three-factor model, for example, that was based on data starting from, hmm, I think it was starting from 63 onward. And then what we did, we went and hand collected the data that we needed going back to 26, so we could test it out of sample. And then we said, okay, that's out of sample US. Now let's look at foreign 
uh, markets and see if we see the same thing. So we're looking for robustness, basically. How to sample the stuff that confirms what you observe uh, in sample. And for that model, we found it everywhere, basically. The same is true of, of the, the five-factor model. We found that pretty much everywhere, too. <clears throat> it's much more difficult to go backward in time because you don't get good profitability data uh, if you go back much past CompuSat going backwards. <clears throat> Gene, can you talk about that time going back and building that data set going back to, I think it was the 20s? Because you, you didn't have the data back then that we have now. Like, How big a deal was this? <laughs> well, you had to um, you had to go by hand into the books. The books existed with the, with the income numbers in them, but they weren't in a machine-readable form. But CRISP, Center for Research and Security Prices at the University of Chicago, had been collecting the stock return data Going, all, going back to 26 from the very beginning of those files. So we had the stock returns. We just didn't have the supporting uh, accounting information. So that was collected by hand. Hmm, wow. But not my hand, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned the out-of-sample testing. How important is the theoretical work to, to make sure that it's not data dredging? Uh, <clears throat> You would like to have a good theoretical model that encompassed uh, these things. For the size and value factor, it's not there. Um, well, the value more so than the size. The size factor is, doesn't have much uh, theoretical underpinning to it. That should be, that should be encompassed in, in uh, other things. As I said, profitability and investment, there's something in the, there's a, some foundations for that in valuation uh, theory. But they're kind of weak. They're kind of, uh, to say the least, uh, weak. It's not a fully specified model in the same way that the that the uh, the Cap M is. So now Bob Merton back in 1973 developed a multi he basically gave us the architecture for multi-factor models and how you develop them. He just didn't put any names on the on the variables. He said this this is the form of such a model. Any such model, any model you develop will, will show up in this, in this form. You have to put names on the variables. Of course, putting the names on the variables is the hard part. Uh, and that's where we were going with the five-factor model, basically. Hmm. So that's the, the ICAPM. Uh, is it possible to know what, what those state variables are that investors are worried about? <laughs> well, <laughs> possible in what sense, though? I mean, can you go into their minds and 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 take out what what dimensions of returns are of special interest or are of disinterest? Mm. What what things do they have positive taste for, and what things do they have negative taste for? And are those tastes general? I mean, does, does everybody have positive taste for one thing and negative taste for another? So it's not that easy, you know. Okay. Paul Merton is one of the smartest guys, if not the smartest guy, I've ever known. And he didn't even attempt to do it. He did not even take a crack at it. He just gave us the mathematical framework and said, run with it, guys. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I, I see what you mean in your papers when you refer to them as unknown state variables now. I, yeah. Right. <laughs> that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. I uh, want to move on to expected returns for a bit. What What... What do you think makes sense to use as an estimate for expected stock returns, just market returns? Okay, that's a very good that's a very good question because I don't know what to use except for the historical average return. The problem is the historical average return is a number whose deviation from the true expected value has a big variance. You just don't get a lot of information, even with a huge sample of of data about what the true expected market return is. So I think the market return from back to 26 to now has probably been in the neighborhood, return in excess of the risk-free rate, has been in the neighborhood of uh, maybe four or 5%. Uh, but the uncertainty around that number means that two standard deviations away could be much closer to zero or much, much higher. Hmm. Even though you have now 100, almost 100 years of data on this. 
Now, you still don't get a very precise estimate of the of the expected value, and that's um, that that's a, a fact of life in investing. That there's, there's, there's just no way to, to get around it or to handle it in any any better way. We just don't know the expected premium of stocks over bills, for example. Hmm. And what about the expected factor premiums? Same thing, because as, as long as you have stock returns in there, the variance around the variance that is associated with them is going to be very high. So, the expected values of any premiums that you put in are always very uncertain. No matter how much data you have, or another way to think about it is, you'll never get enough data to know that for certain you'll get a positive expected premium. Even if I tell you the expected value of the premium, you don't know that in any finite simple you will get that because the very the variance is so high. Huh. Yeah, and and we don't know the expected value, so it's a uh... no, so it's a double yeah. premium, right? Uh, we, we touched on randomness earlier in an efficient market. Do, do you think long-term investors should think about returns as random or as predictable, long-term investors? Predictable in the sense that I think stocks have higher expected returns than, than bills. Um, predictable in that sense. Not predictable in the sense that I know for sure that stocks will do better than bills over any length of, uh, of time. It becomes more likely the longer the period, but it's still never certain. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, though. I'm kind of thinking like uh, I, John Cochran, for example, talks about long-term predictability and that in the very long run, stocks are a little bit less risky than you'd expect if they were completely IID. Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. So there's some, there's some negative autocorrelation that's built in there that lowers the the variability long term relative to to short term. Uh, no, <laughs> those numbers themselves, the, the autocorrelation numbers themselves, are estimated with a lot of uncertainty. So you, you can't really get a precise hook on that either. But that's he, he's right on that. Hmm, interesting. So if you're thinking about long term returns, it's really I I I D and use historical no, no, as I, the yeah. Okay. What it looks like, the reason it's not IID, at least Ken and I wrote a paper on this too, and John did too. Um, it's not the same paper, but the, the paper we wrote basically said, if expected returns vary through time, but their mean reverting, in other words, you know, they don't go off to infinity, plus or minus, uh, they, they tend to come back to a, 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 a constant mean, then you're going to over long, if I look at long periods, I'm going to observe some negative autocorrelation generated by this variation in the underlying uh, mean. And the way the empirical work, this goes back to the early 90s, I think. The way the empirical work turned out, that seemed to be a good story for the behavior of stock returns. But there was okay. never anything There was never anything in that that was a message for investors. Because you're talking about variation in the underlying expected value it's really not so big relative to variation around the expected value. And with a ton of uncertainty about estimating the process that generates that expected time varying expected value. So let's shift to portfolio structure. Um, is there a single optimal portfolio for all investors like in the Markowitz mean variance portfolio theory? Well, <laughs> if I think about market clearing, right? Markets have to clear, everything has to get held. So what that says is that in aggregate, this is like a definition. Investors hold the market portfolio, where the market portfolio is not just stocks, it's everything. So that it all gets held. So that's your, that's the central portfolio of every asset pricing model. Every asset pricing model starts with that and says, deviate from that according to your taste for different dimensions of, of, of risk, but your center, you know, central portfolio is basically this market, uh, market overall market portfolio. So that's uh, that's a good place to start for any investor, I think. You mentioned the market portfolio. Is the stock market a good proxy for the theoretical? Okay. No, because there are too many other assets out, out there, you know? So I got, I got to bring the bonds in too. Okay. So the 
global stock and bond markets is a better proxy for the market. Right. And then, you know, I gotta, gotta start asking myself, what other investments do I have access to and should those be part of the market? So there's some uncertainty about what I should do about government bonds. So are government bonds an asset or a liability? For, you know, you and I are, we can go long government bonds, but we're really, we're really on the short end too because we're gonna be the ones that pay them off. Uh, so. Oh, wow. Not, not clear that the net supply of government bonds, from our perspective, is anything other than zero, because we were on both sides. What What about other other assets like private equity or alternative investments? Right. So those are I don't. In principle, everything that's that could be put into your portfolio is is, is part of the market. Now the question is. Do you really have access to those things in an efficient way, in the sense that you know you can do it with relatively low uh, costs? So we don't have we don't have good models to answer that that question. Um, we, uh, the other thing, the other thing that's really um, bad now, my, some of my colleagues work on this, Steve Kaplan in particular, is is. Uh, you know, what is the expected return on, on private equity? The data don't give you a good answer to that because they're so self-selected. You only get to see the ones that survive pretty much. So you don't get to see how much money was put in there that, that blew up and was, to, was, was, was totally lost. Uh, and that's very important, very important. Um, so I, I don't know what, if I were on your side of the table and I had to advise investors what to do, I don't know what I'd do about private equity because I don't think the data are good enough for me to give you a good answer. So why is the cap-weighted market portfolio a good starting point for well, investor that's, portfolios? Well, that's what people have to, that's what the, that's what the population has to hold in aggregate, right? That, that is the market as far as the population is concerned. You know, in aggregate, we have to hold all the assets out there cap-weighted. Now, you can deviate from that. You can deviate from that, but you know, when you do, you know, you don't have the market portfolio anymore. What what determines that? What what determines when an investor should tilt their portfolio away from the market? Taste. Add, you know, attitudes towards different dimensions. I think of them as different dimensions of risk, but attitudes to different dimensions of risk are um, what do it. You know, in Merton's perspective, it's basically our attitude towards these, whatever these underlying state variables are that generate premiums in various dimensions. So is it just taste or can it be uh, other outside risks like labor income and stuff like that? Or is that a taste? Well, <laughs> our asset pricing models aren't too good about putting labor income in hmm. and, and considering its correlation with asset returns. Um, that was in the uh, 70s, people were worried about that. And basically they threw up their hands. They said, we know how to put this in there as another you know, un non-traded asset. You, nothing you can do about your human capital. You're stuck with it pretty much. Uh, but you wanna know the correlation of your human capital returns with the other returns in your portfolio and take that into consideration in your asset decisions. Well, <laughs> the way we finessed that was we said, well, for most people, the return of the human capital is uncorrelated with everything else, so we don't have to we don't have to consider the the, the correlation matrix very much. Um, basically, that's I think that's the way it stands now. I'm not sure that's satisfactory though. I'm not sure that's satisfactory. Surely, for example, you do not want to invest a lot in the stock of the company you work for because you're likely to go if that stock goes. Right. John, John Carkin's done some interesting work on, on that recently, or, or kind of summary work in his paper, Portfolios for Long-Term Investors. Mm -hmm. We actually talked to um, Sebastian Batermier, who's done some very interesting empirical work on how investors uh, change their portfolios based on labor income. And it, it, it looks like they actually do kind of what you'd expect, theoretically. Hmm. I'll have to look for that. What's the name? 
uh, Sebastian Betermier. We can send you his uh, his papers. Okay. It's it's very good. Um, I I want to touch on international investing for a minute. You, you you've said I've I've heard you say in other interviews that for a U.S. investor you don't really need to worry about international investing. And if I remember correctly, the reasons were uh, there's expropriation that doesn't show up in the historical data, so the the data is better than uh, what you what you can actually get, and that U.S. stocks are no more volatile than global stocks. So therefore, a U.S. investor probably doesn't need too much international diversification. My question is, does that change for someone in a country like Canada, which is a much smaller portion of the global market? Yeah, right. Uh, that's a good one. Sure it does. Sure it does. I mean, um, if, if a Canadian investor only invested in Canadian stocks, it'd be really heavy in mining stocks, right? <laughs> so Right. Basically, one one industry concentration would be pretty pretty high. So I, I would. It's, it's, we Americans are U.S. Americans, <laughs> very you know narrow in our perspective. So this was this was a statement for U.S. investors, not for Canadian investors. Canadian investors clearly should be looking at investments at least in the U.S. So whether the U.S. would ever expropriate Canadian investors. Seems unlikely. Now, people look at expropriation risk as if it's not there anymore. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen. Well, I'll bet there's a lot of expropriation that's going to take place right now uh, between you know the U.S., Europe, and anybody doing business with Russia. So, and the problem is <laughs> nobody cares about investors. <laughs> investors get expropriated. And so, you know, each side always expropriates the other side's investors, but they don't fix it after the war. <laughs> it stays expropriated, even if you win. So uh, that, that's the risk of international uh, investing. And it's not gone. It's not gone. I mean, there's nothing, nothing more poignant right now than that, actually. We mentioned that that doesn't show up in the data. Is there any way to see? Like, how, how do you? I've looked I, I, I haven't found any papers or anything. How do you find no, the also, um I think um, uh, Steve Ross and uh, Roger Ibbotson, maybe there was another guy involved way back when. What they did was they said, Look, there's this risk that nobody takes into account. The markets actually close entirely. So during the Second World War, for example, lots of markets just closed. And then they came back after the after the war. So they went and looked at, well, suppose we were holding the overall market portfolio back in whenever. What happened to us in the meantime when these markets closed? How did we end up? Uh, and they can, they had a paper uh, on that. Now, that was a long time ago, in the 70s maybe. I don't, I don't know what would happen if you updated that. I haven't seen an update of of that, but people do. People have worried about that. That you, know, you, you only get data because the markets are open. You know, <laughs> and when they when they close, you don't um, you don't really you don't have the data, so you tend to ignore that those periods. But an, an example I like to give is, I think Argentina was the second biggest market at some point in the past, and that market has closed multiple times uh, since then. I'm curious, Gene, has your own investment philosophy changed through your career? No. <laughs> but, uh, my, my, my problem is I never expect to, I never intend to retire. So, so, so my, my, my portfolio doesn't have to cover, cover my retirement. It's basically my charities that are going to suffer if I don't make good, good, good decisions. And my kids, of course, but... Um, I don't work, Frank, I'm a really a sloppy investor. I don't, I don't change my portfolio very often. I, I want to circle back to asset pricing models for a second. We, we finished that part of our discussion talking about how size doesn't have any, any real theoretical basis. Why does it still gain a place in the models? Because there's clearly lots of covariation in the returns on small firms that's different from what you observe for large firms. And uh, in the past, at least, I don't know this, we haven't updated this for a while. In the past, at least, uh, that seemed to be 
to show up in differences in average returns. Expect showed up as differences in average returns. It looks like it was possibly differences in expected returns, statistically. Hmm. Do, do you have any? It's pure empirical. It's pure. Yeah. Okay. I have no justification for it from any theory. Hmm. All right. I want to move on to uh, inflation. What assets? You have a paper from uh, many years ago on this, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What, what what assets are hedges against expected and unexpected inflation? And now, <laughs> Oof. so there are these index bonds. That's about as close as you can get. There are right. index government bonds that haven't been very popular in the past, and there's a limit on how much of those you can buy. Uh, I think that's probably why they're not so so popular. But that's that's as close as you can get as an index index bond. So I wrote papers back in the 70s for a period of time when very short-term government debt looked like it was a good hedge against expected inflation. And no sooner did that period, no sooner did I write those papers than thereafter, that hasn't worked. So, so for example, ever since uh, the financial crisis, interest rates have been near zero, inflation has been going all over the place and the interest rates have stayed near zero. So short-term bonds haven't been a good hedge against uh, expected inflation. Now, I think we're, we're, going to, we're going into a very interesting period coming up now about, um, well, this is a different topic. You probably don't want to get into that. But I've been waiting for a long time about what would happen when we actually came up against the period when there was inflation, serious inflation. And we seem to be doing that. Not that I wish that on anybody, but I just wondered what would happen when we came to it because I don't see that the Fed has the tools to really deal with that. I think what happened when they went to the QE business is they decided that the QE business was more important than uh, controlling inflation because inflation was, was very low. But now they're faced with inflation and their only tool is to raise the short-term interest rate. Now I wrote a paper Years, several years back that said, I'm not sure the Fed even controls the short-term interest rate because when it puts out lots of these QE, uh, re lots of reserves, they basically better pay open market interest on those reserves, otherwise the banks won't hold them. They'll try to get rid of them and they'll have a hyperinflation. So they've been paying res reserves on them. And I think they haven't been setting that rate. That's the rate that's dictated to them by the market. So I had a, a paper that basically was trying to kind of document that. And then it said, well, how far out does any influence go of the Fed? Oh, it was very short. I mean, the term structure at the intermediate and long end had a mind of its own. It had nothing, basically nothing to do with the, the Fed, Fed funds rate. So what does varying the Fed funds rate? They can only go in one direction as far as I can see. They can go up. They can't go down. If they go up, fine. The banks will sit on the, sit on the reserves. But how much will they have to go to actually slow down economic activity? Now, let me put it differently. What firms take the short-term overnight rate as their cost of capital? I don't know any. How sensitive are they to that to that rate? Maybe not at all. You know, this, this whole this whole assumption about how they'll control inflation with that huge balance sheet that they have is really untested. We're going to test it now. We'll have one observation. <laughs> a year or two from now on this process. Sorry, that was a tangent. No, no, no. I, want, I, I want to keep going on this tangent, so no worries. Exactly, Gene. Like, what can the Fed do? Can they do anything? Well, they, I, the question is, <laughs> if they raise the federal funds rate, how far do they have to raise it to have any effect on inflation? That's a wide open question. It's never, we don't have any data at all uh, on that because this is a new, this QE business is a new regime. The Fed was always operated in an environment where there were no free reserves, basically. And now you get, I think, about $9 trillion worth of, of, uh, of free reserves uh, out there. So we, we've never had this regime, so we don't know what it will take to make it, to, to make it work, what it will take in terms of raising this short-term rate. They're talking about, the big discussion is, is it an eighth or a quarter? Well, I don't think that's anywhere near what they what they'd have to push it up to have any any effect. It might be ten percent. Now that's an ex, that's extreme, but 
wouldn't surprise me that they had to bring bring it up so that the real rate was positive. It wouldn't surprise me at all because historically the real rate's been fluctuates to be within plus or minus one percent of zero. Can you elaborate a little bit on on uh, before QE, so before the the uh, ample reserves regime, what what the Fed would have done to to stop inflation sure. and why they can't do that now? Yeah, so what they would do is they would just it, they cut back on reserves, they'd make it more difficult to, for the banks to lend, and that, that would in principle slow real activity and and pull inflation down. So the idea was, well, we'll cause a little recession. And that'll do it. So I they, they weren't terribly good at that because if you go back to the late seventies and early eighties, we had inflation running at twenty percent, near twenty percent, for for a couple of years. So they were they were never very good at this game. So what do you say to a typical retiree who might have a 60-40 portfolio? They've done their planning properly. So given what you said about inflation, what would you say to them? Well, let's say hope that the hope that the sixty part of that gets isn't hurt by the inflation. So far, this this boat hasn't been hasn't been bad for stocks. In the past, high inflation has been negatively related to stock returns, but that that hasn't been true in this this uh, experience. So they might be protected in the stock part of their portfolio, but you're stuck. You know, you gotta you gotta hold the assets that are out there. That's all you can do. So you can worry about it, but it doesn't help a lot. I hate to chuckle at that one, but it's true. That's, um, yeah, that's that's difficult advice to give. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, that's why I say I'm glad I'm on this side of the table, <laughs> not on your side. Uh, so you, you talked about QE and how the Fed's got themselves in a bit of a pickle now. Um, can, can the Fed cause inflation? Oh. Well, in the old days, they could cause inflation because um, they they could put on a lot of reserves. Uh, they weren't paying interest on reserves, so the banks didn't want them. So the banks would expand their balance sheets in order to get rid of the reserves, and that could heat up the world in such a way that you got a lot of inflation, and vice versa. So that, that was the idea in the old days, is that the small changes in the, in the monetary base, reserves plus uh, currency, would have a big effect on inflation, uh, but that's gone. That's gone. Is that still a lending a lending channel in that case? Yeah, like in that still- case, it was a lending channel, right? Okay. You don't have a lending channel now. Well, they're hoping you do. They're hoping that by raising the Fed funds rate uh, uh, way above what the equilibrium would be, that that'll, that'll get banks to sit on the reserves. They won't try to lend them out, so it'll, re- it'll reduce economic activity. But we'll see. We'll see. Plus, this is a different world now. You know, you have all these fintech companies out there. They're not even part of the system. They're doing a ton of lending. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Uh, okay, I want to move on to, to theory versus versus practice because obviously you've you've been uh, working well, th- theory and, and empirical work, academic work versus practice. I guess you you worked in academia. For a very long time, you've also worked with Dimensional, implementing these ideas for for a very long time. What, what's the biggest challenge in translating your academic work into live investment products? Well, initially, initially, it was we didn't know whether these things would carry over, whether you could actually implement them. So, for example, when a couple of students at Chicago here came up with the small firm effect. Most of the academic profession said, yeah, that's in the data, but you'll never get it because you're going to get wiped out by the, by the bid-ass spread on the small stocks. Um, so forget about the small stock premium. And it turned out that that wasn't true. So that slow trading in small stocks basically didn't pay the bid-ass spread. Dimensional basically established that through its own uh, trading. So n- nobody, nobody talks that, that way uh, about it uh, anymore. And then, you know, let's say the value premium, you, you worry that if too many people get into that, maybe they can kill it, you know? Uh, so if, if they're getting into it because they think it's a profit opportunity rather than a different risk factor, that could kill it. Um, 
So that remains to be seen, I think. We'll, we'll never have enough data to know the answer uh, to that, but that's one of the issues involved there. So <laughs> but another way to say it is kind of where we started. There's so much uncertainty involved in the outcomes from investing that it's difficult to extract the signal from the noise. It's difficult to tell what's the real stuff going on on the line, what we see every day, given it's what we see every day or every year or whatever is buried in a lot of noise. So e even if value is theoretically a risk premium, if people believe it's a profit opportunity, even if it is riskier, the premium can still go away? Sure. Oh, wow. Hadn't thought about that. Sure. Well, look, if I were misled and thought that stocks were much less risky in the long run than in the short run, I could kill the stock premium over bonds too. If enough people believe that. But they might get it's not special to, it's not special to value or small or any of that or any of that. If you if I don't really understand the differences the, 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 the long term does not erase uncertainty that's in the short term, unless you get a lot of negative cor cor correlation in there, uh, then we, the markets can become, that's kind of an inefficiency, actually. Did you kill a risk premium in a, because of false beliefs? But the risk would eventually show up. I guess we don't know that. If the risk eventually showed up, they, they, they might. So the way we thought about it originally was that Value stocks are riskier in the sense that if I look under the hood, what I find is that those companies are not too, are not, you know, they, they, they're kind of in a, they kind of have been badly run or whatever. Or they're in industries that are sort of declining. So that's, that's the real risk that are, that's involved in, in, in taking on uh, uh, value stocks is that they're, it's, not a, it's not a healthy end of the, uh, of the economy. Uh, so the question though is, should that carry a risk premium? You know, that, it seems to have been there in the past. If people are not concerned with that sort of risk, because everybody that works for those companies should be concerned with it. Um, but if otherwise, if that's not enough to tilt people away from those stocks, then you'd expect that premium to go away. But who knows? We, 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 it'll take a long, long time of data before we know the answer to that. Hmm. And I guess if, if value is a proxy for the unknown state variables in the ICAPM, then the risk could show up at times that people don't want it to. Right, right. Hmm. So what, what have you learned from working with Dimensional that you maybe wouldn't have learned through academic research? Oh, <laughs> well, they, so when we were small, we didn't have a lot of money to invest and the markets were different. Uh, you know, market microstructure, which is the end of the market that can cost you a lot of money because of trading costs. Um, that was a much less sophisticated business than, than it is now. So now they have all kinds of trading um, approaches to try to minimize the trading costs of the, of, the, uh, of the portfolio. So seeing all of that evolve has been really eye-opening. And <laughs> there's a whole block of literature in academia about market microstructure. And experience has shown it all to be basically, most lots of it to be basically hogwash. I mean, they're, they're on the wrong, on the wrong, are on the wrong track tack. Uh, but there's, there's a difference between your trading costs if you do slow trading or if you do uh, fast trading. So that's um that's been something we've we've learned learned a lot of, a lot about. Um, Basically, you know, there's always learning and implementing something that, that you've done with data, but you've never done in practice. So what, what's the slip between the data and the practice? Is there any? And how do you go about it so that you don't create unforeseen blockages uh, somewhere in the, in the process? So I think Dimensional's been, Dimension has been very good at that. Uh, the company now is much more technically sophisticated in terms of how to deal with markets, how to deal with almost everything than it was, you know, in the first, let's say, five years of existence. The first five years of existence, you could take the whole company home every night on a very small tape 
you know, <laughs> a very small uh, floppy disk. Forget it now. <laughs> so as a follow-up, Gene, what's it like to look back and see your academic work actually implemented in practice? Well, it's it's kind of satisfying. So I don't I don't take a lot of credit from that. I think my my generation came along at a time when there was nothing in academia. Finance didn't exist basically. So my generation basically opened the field up, um, and it was you know great to be involved with all the all the people who did it. Um, but we were kind of lucky in the sense that um, there hadn't been anything before that. So it was like f- fishing in a barrel, you know, you just threw the line in and you had a, always came up with a fish. <laughs> the current people coming into finance have a, have a big body of stuff they have to master before they can actually think about uh, doing research in the, in the area. So they're, they're a little bit hard tied relative to what we were in the old days. Of course, the downside of that is we're now all old. So, <laughs> so w- when you were fishing in that barrel, did you know what a big deal this was going to become? Like, did, did you have a sense? No, no, I'm not, absolutely not. Really? Yeah, absolutely not. Look, we, we were young people trying to do academic research that would eventually get us tenure, you know? So we, we didn't really know where this would go. Plus, you know, as Mike Jensen always said, I'm amazed that people pay us to do stuff we would do anyway. <laughs> so, so, then, t- talking about academic research. And that, that's basically true. I mean, the people who do it basically love to do it. This isn't, isn't really a job. So, so did, did you see at all the, the evolution of indexing and Vanguard and, you know, the book Trillions by Robin w- Wigglesworth? Like, did, did you foresee this at all back then? Well, for, in my view, that all took too long that the evidence was there in the early 60s that this was the way to go. And it took a long time before that had a big impact. Um, when, when Ken French did his uh, <coughs> presidential address at the American Finance Association, basically in that whatever was 50 years period since the beginning of, of, the, of this research in the early 60s, late 50s, um, the world had gone from 0% passive to I think it was 20% passive at that point. And now it's up to 50, but it's still far from 100. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't know, to me, that seems slow. <laughs> do, do you think anything uh, y- useful for a lack of a better word has come out of behavioral finance? Um, Yeah, I, I, I do. See, I have, I have trouble with this because what do you mean by behavioral finance? All of economics is behavioral. So the issue, the issue is whether the behavior is rational or irrational. So what, what we call behavioral finance now is basically looking at the world as if behavior is irrational. Um, now that's, and the behavioral people, my good friend Dick Rowe, for, I'm sorry, Dick Thaler, for example, um, they, they acknowledge that this is kind of a nihilistic game, uh, that basically they have no advice for investors because they think whatever advice they put out there, everybody's irrational, so they kind of screw it up. <laughs> so, so, so basically they end up in the same place we do. They say, no, just index everything because you're too, du- you're too dumb to do anything other than, other than that. Um, so that's... Uh, I, that's that's, and I, I, I way back when I wrote a paper. It's one of the most highly cited papers in the in the Journal of Finance. It was about market efficiency and the challenge for behavioral finance. And I said, okay, you guys have been criticizing us, but that's all you have. You just could without efficient markets, you have no area because that's all you do is criticize efficient markets. It's time for you to develop asset pricing model of your own that we can all turn around and test. And in criticize, and to this day they haven't done that. So, to this day, it's still just a criticism of efficient markets. One of the things behavioralists talk a lot about is bubbles. What do you think about bubbles in the context of of market efficiency? Well, <laughs> the word bubbles, I I, I canceled my subscription to the Economist 
because during the financial crisis, the word bubble appeared in almost every issue in such a sloppy way that I couldn't stand it anymore. So I wanted to know what they considered a bubble. So in my view, a bubble is something that has a predictable ending. In other words, that you can make money predicting how the, how the bubble will evolve. If it's just accumulation of random numbers, it looks like a big hump. Well, okay, fine. I'm, I don't call that a bubble. So, so I'll tell you a famous story. So, so who, what's, I'm forgetting his name, unfortunately. But there was a famous agricultural economist at Stanford. This is way back before efficient markets really came out. And he thought his colleagues could see patterns in data where there were none. So what he did was he took a random numbers generator and he accumulated the numbers. So, you know, you got lots of variation, but it was all just random. And he brought it into the faculty lounge and he showed it to his colleagues. And they, he said it took them about 15 minutes to come up with stories about what episodes and prices uh, those were. And the, the message really was, they're seeing things that don't exist. This is just all randomness. And that's basically what I say about people who talk about bubbles and markets. You gotta tell me how to, how to predict the endings of these things. Otherwise I don't call them bubbles. I just call them randomness. Hmm. Uh, 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 go ahead, go Cameron. Ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna ask Gene, so does the proliferation of you know increased computing power, artificial intelligence, machine learning, does all of that make it easier for active managers to earn alpha? <laughs> so I thought we were going to get through this without that question, because I've never done this talk. I've never done one of these, and that question hasn't come up. <laughs> so, so we're consistent. And the answer has been the same for, I don't know, 40 years now. I mean, so I came online when computers were first coming around. I, I was one of the first ones in at the University of Chicago to use the old 709 that they that they that they brought online. Um, but anyway, my answer always is, you know, in principle, we have a lot more information. We get it a, a lot faster, at least. Maybe it's the same information, but we get it a lot faster than we used to. And we have ways of distributing it that were unknown, you know, 50 years, 50 years ago. But you can't see the tracks of that in the behavior of prices. You can't see that that said, any notice effect, any noticeable effect on whether the market is, is more or less uh, efficient. So that's been the answer to that question for about 50 years. We just don't know. And the, my view of that is we don't know because the market has always looked pretty efficient. It hasn't, hasn't, doesn't look more efficient now. It doesn't look less efficient now. It's always looked pretty efficient. Uh, so it's nice to have all this information and to get it quickly and cheaply, but it doesn't seem to have improved markets that much. I, I think They're I've heard- pretty good. I, I think I've heard your former student, Cliff Asnes, talk about machine learning kind of like as a supercharged version of the anecdote that you told about the, uh, the agricultural economist finding patterns in randomness. <laughs> right, right. So uh, there, right, right. there was a story that I don't know if you remember because there was, a, there was a period of time when with computers coming around, the people in physics were having difficulty finding jobs, so they thought finance was going to be an easy field, and they'd come in and develop you know, models to predict uh, markets and prices, and that was a huge failure. It didn't work. <laughs> but they'll try again. Always, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Artificial intelligence is just that. Yeah. Artificial is the, is the key word there. And it would be competitive too, right? That, that's the way I've always thought about it is if, if there's an AI that's good enough to earn alpha, then someone else is going to build, build a competitive AI that- That'll, It'll kill itself, right? Right. Uh, I, I want to move on to crypto for a little bit. It, you are on a, a Bitcoin podcast that I listened to. It was a, from back in 2015. Um, and I'll quickly summarize your position from, from that interview. Uh, you, you kind of said that Bitcoin's a, an accounting system for exchange that may be useful to drug dealers because it's somewhat anonymous, but it's otherwise no different from a volatile checking account. Has, has your thinking changed at all since then? Well, here's, here's, here's what I say. I like this area anyways. I, people should, because there's so much to talk about this, it's garbage. Um, so you got to distinguish between the medium of exchange, like 
the cryptocurrency itself which, uh, and the, 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 the mechanism that does the exchanging. So it's the blockchain was the, people often don't distinguish between the blockchain and let's say the, cryptocur the cryptocurrency, uh, but they are different. So I, I could put the cryptocurrency into the exchange mechanism that, that the Fed runs among banks. And I, and I could put reserves into the blockchain if I, if I, if I wanted to. So you got to distinguish between those two. Now, the, the problem with, let's say with Bitcoin, if you go back to the old monetary theory, what it said was, if something's highly variable in real terms, it's not going to survive as a medium of exchange. Simple way to think about it is, that, uh, firms don't want to do business in a medium of exchange that itself can put them out of business. You know, just its own variability can put them out of business. So if you look now at the people who, quote, take Bitcoin for transactions, what you'll find is they take it, but they don't hold it. They get rid of it almost instantly. They just, they just sell it. Now, that, that's one, one thing. The second part of it is, okay, what gives Bitcoin its value? If it's not really being used as a medium of exchange, well, then it should really have no, no, no value. And its volatility would kill it as a medium of, of exchange. Now, these stable coins that people are talking about, they're, they're better because they're basically linked to the dollar. Um, that, that I think they recognize this problem. But at that point, they're kind of like bank reserves. You know, they're, they're just linked to the, the, the dollar. Now, I don't know, is the Fed going to allow that, that kind of competition in there? And is it really credible that a private issuer of reserves will always be ready and able to exchange it for currency on demand? I don't know. That's a tough one. That's a really tough one. How much, how much currency do you keep in the background in order to, to make that, that credible? Uh, so we'll see. Now, now that's, that's separate. So that's the medium of exchange. The method of exchange is something else. You could certainly improve on the method of exchange that the Fed uses to clear transactions. There's no reason it should take two days to, to uh, clear, or even a day, to, to clear transactions through that, that system. I mean, it's, a, it's all just a computer. I, <laughs> I wrote this paper like 25 years ago that, that the exchanges in the, in the computer age, age should be instant. They should be able to, to trade, to trade uh, reserves instantly across, across the system. So the, the, there are efficiency improvements that could take place in the mechanism. Now, blockchains, blockchains don't look to me like that kind of system. They're incredibly hogs. They're incredible hogs in terms of the electricity they use. Because to have a not to not have somebody overseeing the system, uh, like the Fed oversees the, the system among banks, becomes very expensive. And it uses incredible energy. Uh, so uh, that, that doesn't look to me like that system has much of a, a future to it. But but we'll see. We'll see. But I think there's a lot of a lot of junk that gets talked about in terms of cryptocurrency. I don't think people who write about it really understand what it is and what what it, what it needs to be in order to survive. What What do you mean by junk? Like, what is a what What's the kind of junk? Well, they don't, the kind of junk is they don't sit around and say, "Well, why does this thing have any value at all?" You know, the answer to that from monetary theory would be. If I don't use Bitcoin to, to execute transactions, it has no real value. I mean, it's just, they're just numbers, you know? They're not, there's, no, there, there's no real use for it. So if bank reserves have value because they are an electronic means of exchange, a very efficient means of, uh, of exchange. Well, maybe the blockchain, blockchain is that, but you know, that, if that's it, then you get the problem that this thing has a highly variable real value. So it shouldn't survive as a means of exchange on that basis alone. Uh, so they, these are the things I don't think people, I don't hear anybody talking about that. I don't think people coming up now actually learn monetary theory. <laughs> so, so what I, do you think I, is, I, go ahead, Ben. I think that the the, the, the argument from the, the Bitcoin community would be that it, it has value because it is censorship resistant. So even though it is highly inefficient because it has, trustless or, or, or uh, not centralized trust consensus, which is expensive and it's volatile, people who 
can't operate within the existing financial system because they're criminals or they're in a country that doesn't have infrastructure? Yeah, that, 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 that produces a demand for it, basically. You got to have a demand for this as a medium of exchange. So Ill illegal transaction produces a demand for it. Uh, but <laughs> the, then my question is, how much of that do you need to give it, you know, substantial value? How much? Yeah. How, how many illegal transactions? How much do you have of the illegal transaction trade do you have to get to make that work? I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't claim to know the answer to that. Um, but that's that's the that's the question implied by that by that line of uh, defense. Is that you, you got to now you got to tell me something more about what it would take to to make that survive? Yeah, and we can't know that. But there, a paper came out recently that found that I, I think. Uh, 90% of Bitcoin transactions are not economically meaningful. Um, it's just people trading it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, 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 that's, not, that's not telling. So you could have zillions of those transactions, right? Just people trading. But there still could be a large amount of absolute you know, transaction goods, goods being exchanged in the background. And right. still that be very big. So that doesn't that doesn't really answer the question. So what do you think is driving the incredible rise in price of Bitcoin? In like the past seven years is up like eleven thousand percent or something. Yeah, right. Right. That's fine. I mean, I I'm not buying it, but because I, I think it's volatility, it's it, it it it's high price is very impressive. The volatility is equally impressive. You know, it goes up and down thirty percent in the period of short periods of, of, of time. That's really impressive. You, you mentioned for, for the for for reserves or for say say the dollar um, that it's an, an efficient means of electronic transactions and that makes it valuable. Is that what gives the dollar value? Ah, you got to limit the supply, and then you got to have people willing to trade in it. You know, willing to uh, execute transactions in it, and then you have value. So. The dollar is a fiduciary currency. There's nothing there, um, except that the fact that the supply is limited. <laughs> so this is taking us back to the uh, QE period again. So this is another thing that really bothers me, is that in the old days, we had a supply of the monetary base, which is basically currency plus reserves, and neither of them paid interest. So they looked very, they looked identical. Now you've got currency plus reserves, and the reserves basically pay, pay market interest. And you can go back and forth, the banks can go back and forth between them on demand. That's written into the Federal Reserve Act. So you don't have the supply of a medium of exchange, which the Fed has control over, because the reserves are now just another interest-bearing asset, another asset out there that's bearing market interest. So the fact that it's exchangeable for currency Currency in principle could be used to control the price level, but when it's exchangeable freely for reserves, that goes out the window. The supply is no longer fixed by anybody. Hmm. So do you, do you need to have a fixed supply for, for the dollar? For you need to have somebody controlling that supply if you want to control inflation with it. Interesting, because banks control or, or the, the, the Fed controls or tries to control interest rates, but not necessarily yeah, monetary it, base. It, it gave up on controlling the monetary base when it went to QE. The price of QE was giving up control of the monetary base. Hmm. It, it is a, so w one of the things that, again, Bitcoin people would say is that Bitcoin is better than a fiduciary currency like the dollar because the supply is is mechanically fixed. Is, is that a good property of a, of a currency or of a money? Well, Mil Mil Milton Friedman always said that that was a good pro property of a currency. He was always in favor of the Fed limiting the supply of currency plus reserves to a fixed rate of increase every year. Basically the expected expansion of long-term expansion of the economy. And that's it, no more. Uh, so that's basically the same statement that having knowing how much is going to be out there uh, and how much will be out there in the future is very important if you want this thing to be the medium of, of exchange. 
Now, that's a big problem with a fiduciary currency. They often blow up because governments can't resist throwing more of that out there and, and spending it. <clears throat> so that's, that is an advantage. Having a fixed supply is an advantage. <laughs> the huge disadvantage is the variability in real terms of the value of that supply. That's the cost of, of using that as a medium of exchange. <clears throat> hmm. So to have stable real value, uh, uh, right, but uh, in, the, in the current system to try and have a stable real value. Oh, we don't currently have stable real value? Not a Bitcoin. Oh yeah, sorry. It, back to the the the, the dollar. Um, oh, if you yeah. give up, well, so so far, right? <laughs> right. But we've had periods where, you know, if you go back to the seventies, we've had periods where the, the value of the dollar was highly uh, not wasn't that unstable. It was just going down all the time, fast. That can kill what, the currency too. What, what do you gain by fixing the supply? That like maintaining real value long term, like the the gold standard kind of argument. No, so if you maintain the total supply of what people transact in, what monetary theory would say is the real value of that should go up through time if the economy expands, because you have less of it to use in transactions. So you basically create more by increasing the value of it, by letting the value increase on its own. So you expect the price level to go down in that case. So it's deflationary. Isn't that is is that is that bad though? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Huh. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Just want to shift gears to your career, Gene, and we're curious: who are the most influential figures in your early academic career? Oh, gee, uh, Merton Miller and Harry Roberts. Easy. Martin Miller, you probably everybody knows, he was you know one of the founders of, of finance, especially the capital structure in the of finance. Uh, Harry Roberts, very few people know, but he was the one that gave me my upbringing in statistics and how you go about doing meaningful statistical uh, work and how you look at it. Uh, so those two were the most important. How, how many hours per day uh, asking this to you because you've been incredibly productive throughout <laughs> your career. Um, how, how many hours per day do you think the brain can handle thinking work? Okay, that's a very good question. It took me a long time to figure that out. So I would say you have about four hours a day. So I'd say over my academic life, I do my work in the morning and I do other people's work in the afternoon. Because in the afternoon, I'm burned out. <clears throat> I can't do the, the original stuff. That, I'm, my, my, my productivity per unit time goes, goes, goes way down. Uh, so then what I found out later in life is you can take, this is when I took up golf, <laughs> what I found out was you can take those four hours anytime. It's not important that you get them in the morning. You can go play golf in the morning and get the four hours in the afternoon, but then nobody else gets your time. So. <laughs> so, so you tackle something hard for four hours every day. Yeah, every every day, seven days a week. Right, like your legend, your work ethic is legendary. Well, I don't know. I mean, we've heard so, Ken remember, French talk about remember. you calling him on Christmas Day before. Well, remember now, I've always... With, People are ask me, why did I go into academics? I say, because I would have control over my time and it wouldn't interfere with my athletic interests. So initially it was tennis. I played tennis every day for a couple of, couple of hours. And now I'm an old guy. So at age 63, I switched from tennis to golf. <laughs> uh, but that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time. It's not, uh, basically academia is a way to, that you can you can squeeze your work in around your other other activities. What do you think explains the, I mean, uh, unbelievably productive relationship that you've had with Ken French? Oh, well, it's we have so very similar work habits. So um, I know that I can call him or. Email him at any time, and he'll be 
He'll be working at about the same time that I'm that I'm working. Right? He does more hours than I do. He's able to um, he's able to survive sleeping five hours a night. If I sleep five hours a night, I kill people the next day. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so <laughs> so that we were way different in that, that that respect. But we have similar interests too. That's that's good and bad. So you really we're similar, but we're also different. So you gotta you gotta be different along a lot of dimensions. Dimensions, otherwise, you know, there's nothing more than the sum of the parts that com, comes out of the comes out of the relation. Um, but I worked with other people in the past that didn't work the same long hours or the same consistent hours, and I figured out I couldn't work with them because our our work times didn't intersect enough. So our final question, Gene, mm. how do you define success in your life? Oh, my success? <laughs> okay, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I guess the primary thing is having um, a family that turns out to be something you're really proud of. I, I've been really successful on that, but my wife gets most of the credit for that, not me, because I have spent too much time working, and she's, she's the one that did all the work on the, on the, on the family. Uh, side. So that, that's very important. The second thing very important, I would, when every young people, person comes to me, I say, look, it's, imp- it's important to find something, you're going to spend at least a 30 of life working. It's important to find something that you really like to do, otherwise those hours are going to be basically, basically torture. That's the first part of that advice. The second part is find something that not too many other people want to do so that you can make pretty good money out of it. So you don't, you don't want to be a ballet dancer, for example, because very few people succeed in, in that area. You, you, even to do uh, lots of areas where that, that, that can be a problem. Uh, so that, that's the advice I kind of give to people. Terrific. Well, Gene, this has been a real pleasure to, to see you and, and for you to participate in our 200th episode. So thanks so much <laughs> for your time. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, Gene. Uh-huh.